Hey everybody, Dave Lindbergh in Hong Kong with another episode of the THD podcast. Today we have a company from the States called Dinneberg Technology. And as I always like to do, I pontificate on what it is. So I believe it's a technology where they have a passive and driver in plane. So for things where you can't put a passive on the back, like maybe ceiling speakers or in-car door speakers, this might be the solution. So let's let's get into the meeting them and we'll find out about that. But before we forget, let's remember... The Alti Association, our sponsor, so be sure to check out their website, and uh, it's a great organization for networking within the audio industry, so we encourage you to get involved with them. But today, we got a big panel of people joining us, uh, so we have uh, Mike Clasco in the Bay Area with uh, Menlo Scientific. Hi, Mike. How you doing? Hey, Dave. All right, and Roger Shively. In the Seattle area, he's got his uh, flying his flag behind him there. So Shiley <laughs> Acoustics International. Yes, uh, yes. Good afternoon, Roger. How are you? Hello. Hi, Dave. How you doing? Good. All right. And Simon Weston in Japan. Uh, good morning to you, Simon. How are you? Very good, mate. Thank you. All right. And the uh, the the man of the hour here, Simon Dinenberg in uh, the States somewhere. Where are you, Simon? Dallas, Texas. Dallas, Texas. All right. So, uh, Dynaberg Technologies. Uh, so, yeah, uh, maybe Simon Dynaberg, why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Thank you, Dave, uh, for pro providing a platform for us, being able to spread awareness about our company, our journey, and our big idea. Hello, my name is Simon Dynaberg, and I am one of the founders of Dynaberg Technologies. Dynaberg is a technology startup focused on evolution of sound. We have developed a new speaker technology that helps achieve big sound from a smaller package when compared to conventional passive radiator or port design. Today, I'm looking forward to discuss the benefits and advantages of our technology with help of Roger Shively and Michael Clasco, who have been our guides and mentors when it comes to navigating the space. Thank you. Our right. unique approach. Go go on, go on. Sorry. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, our unique approach to packaging a passive radiator not only optimizes the passive radiator response, but also harnesses the back wave energy from a loudspeaker diaphragm more efficiently, greatly enhancing the active driver performance. This is primarily achieved using our patented concentric coplanar stabilizer, or C2S technology, how we call it, which is basically a passive radiator concentric to an active cone driver with additional benefits that cannot be achieved without the C2S technology. Our company goal is to provide audio product developers and manufacturers with competitive edge. Let's dive in, Dave. All right. That sounds like a, a head full for me. Hopefully some of these tech guys <laughs> have uh, digested that. Um, but yeah, let's get into a presentation. What is Dynaburg technology? The Dynaburg technology is a big sound, small footprint. The sound is a physical phenomenon. Its creation, design, and development must submit to the physical laws of nature. Michael Dynaburg. This is the gentleman who originally came up with this idea. My father is a physicist by trade, and he spent probably last 20 years trying to convince me, industry, and everybody else that uh, the simple idea he, he, he put together actually have a lot of benefits, which we've been trying to prove for the last five years trying to utilize uh, most advanced uh, Comsol multiphysics approach. What are the C2S benefits compared to a traditional passive radiator? The way we like to think about it, uh, we are in a way standing on the shoulders of a giant and we're just trying to take what already exists and improve it. The benefits uh, which we were able to prove through testing and console are lower distortion, extended frequency range, greater efficiency when it comes to power consumption, 
simpler packaging when you compare it to passive radiator or a pork design. You have a single acoustic center, better dispersion and pattern control, and better physical linearity of the sound. Uh, one of the questions we were asked uh, during this journey, what is the marketplace for this technology? And one of the things we had to prove and confirm through prototyping and console multiphysics that technology scales. Because at the end of the day, we're using the same driver and the same passive radiator, which been used by technology for over 50 years. And they scale depends on what the product is requires. And today we know with the certainty that this approach can be used in portable devices, automotive, airspace, headphone, architectural, or put it blindly, any design where today you would use the passive port or passive radiator, you can use a C2S technology. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to pass Bhutan at this point, probably to Mike, to let him speak a little bit. And then we can go to Roger Shively and we can dive in a little bit of more technical data. All right. So, so basically, a lot of people look at this and say, I've seen a passive ring radiator before. Uh, isn't it obvious? How did these guys get a patent? But there's a, a half a dozen other claims in the patent for secondary and third order effects that are optimized in this design. Uh, there's some things that go on behind the baffle that keep things more uh, laminar and the pressure axiosymmetric. That is to say that if you have an odd shaped high aspect ratio box and or passive radiator that's on one side or the other, uh, you're likely to get some rocking in the driver and some rocking in the passive radiator and having the passive radiator axiosymmetric, the coupling with the cone and uh, the pressure behind the baffle uh, gets rid of some lossy effects. Uh, there's another benefit to a passive ring radiator and that's to say the um, pattern control at the lower end of the mid-range is a little bit better controlled. Uh, and if you have a small box and with a small speaker where the driver has a relatively extended bandwidth, then there's a lot of stuff from inside the box that's going to come through the port and have comb filter effects. The passive ring radiator acts as a bandpass mm -hmm. where the thickness and its characteristics will drop off some of the crap from inside the box. So there's many, many of these side effects that going through the patent, um, they have benefits that you hadn't anticipated that actually show up in comp sol measurements and show up in oralization, uh, not just in the physical measurements, but they're perceived in listening. And this is when I hand the torch over to Roger, who did that testing. Okay. All right. So yeah, just a question, right front? Just a question yeah, before you start, Roger. So when you talk about this axiometric and rocking, <laughs> is that for the lay person, is that kind of just in general like rub and buzz with a more complicated moving masses going on with the passive plus the driver is that well let me just say axiosymmetric means that every radii the coupling to the passive radiator is equally distant and the phase is the same and the pressure is the same and the distance is the same <clears throat> just just so things are more closer to what we do would expect and when you have a passive radiator in the back or the side uh, the pressure that goes on in the box is a little different and it loads uh, the edge of the diaphragm and the surround a little bit. And when it's exactly concentric, um, things are just better behaved without some sort of <clears throat> weird side effects that you have to worry less about. Okay. All right. Sorry, Roger. Jump in. No, no, it's okay. Um, good questions. Jump in with questions. The, that's the best part. So um, I guess this is yeah, this is from uh, the slides that uh, Simon's got there. Um, and this is some of the data that uh, came out of uh, the console comparison to a traditional passive radiator. And this this passive radiator um, that we're comparing it to is one with a passive radiator. It has a consistent 
same size of surface area, surface dimension, um, but it has to be placed on the backside of a box as opposed to one that's concentric and in the same plane essentially as the the, the active driver. And so that's what you were talking about earlier, where, where how do you package something that goes into a ceiling and has a passive radiator to get some of the benefits of a passive radiator or put that into a car door for that matter. And mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's the benefit here. This is showing on axis. Now, that may be enough for some to see that there's a difference, but in general, it's it's a subtle difference. Um, if uh, we go and see what's going on off, off axis between the two, then you'll see some benefits here. And you know, why do I focus on off axis? Is because in the home or the business installation for, say, a ceiling or a, a wall speaker, uh, you're never on axis uh, or rarely on axis. And likewise, in a car, which in case you're never on axis and so when we're looking for a you know an improved sound experience something that's full band um, and then has a very smooth off axis response essentially a smooth power acoustic power response so that wherever we are we're getting a very similar experience is important for us to get the qualities and in this case on the right hand side you see the response of a, a, a traditional rear firing passive radiator versus the Dinaberg uh, solution on the left side there. And this is showing, I guess, all the way from 20 to 10K. It's good. And you can see that when you get to the Dinaberg up in the higher frequencies uh, in the 6K, 4K range, you start to see that it's broadening out um, in, in between zero to 60 degrees. And that is what does actually happen. The, the measurements that we've you know had made of some prototypes uh, show that. And and the other part of the experience, as Mike said, uh, there you know, when you listen to it, whether it's through the simulation which we have done, but actually with the prototypes that were built off of the simulation, you'll actually hear on axis and off axis improvements that you can walk to 60 degrees off axis and get something that's very similar to on axis versus something that doesn't have that. Uh, with a passive radiator, and so one of the th so we see it's happening. We know it's happening. We're hearing it that it's happening. We were starting to wonder why, uh, and understanding the technology behind it, and that's why we 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 built the the console model to begin with. Um, and so, I, I can um, show some of those. Go ahead. Sorry. Hey Roger, that um uh, the uh, I think it's the six k hertz that stands out the most is there's a big rear lobe on a yes. uh, traditional passive radiator and not on the C2S. Um, what's yeah. the mechanism of that? Is that passive radiator rear-facing? Is it generating? Yes, it is, yeah. I could actually show you some of the modeling here in a sec, and you'll see that, yeah, it is rear-facing. And so if you stuck it that into an installation, then you would lose it um, uh, completely because all the, uh, the, the benefit is from the back. And so in this case, there is no rear-firing radiator for the, the, the Dinaberg alignment. And so it's uh, all forward facing. And then what I could show, and I might do that if it's okay, Dave, if I, I switch yep. screens here. Okay, so I'm gonna yep. share my screen. Okay, so this is a, a sort of a picture of the construction. So what I'll do is I'll I'll kind of give you a, a, an overview of it here real quick. There it is what it looks like. This is the design. Um, the center is an active three inch and the outer portion of it is a, a, is the passive radiator and that is a six and a half inch. And so and initially when we started working with uh, Simon, uh, the, the design was a much larger size and we just we did model that just to understand it, but we didn't have any real prototypes to compare it to. And, and when you're doing a simulation, you really want to validate your model in some way. And so we went and picked the standard size of a six inch diameter, you know, woofer that you could uh, fit into a into an installation, whether it's a ceiling or a wall or even in a door, but that's the mounting uh, footprint. And so what we did is built it into that in the six uh, with a three inch active driver in the center and the passive radiator there. And that's the the data that we we generated in console to compare it to. But we also compared that to you know a, an active three inch with the rear passive radiator. And that's the, the model that we have. But if I show you this real quick, let it run. So you can kind of get a feel for the uh, inside dimensions that we have going on there. Um, let me quickly advance to some other pictures of this. Um, so this is what was modeled in, con in concept where you have the outer ring interactive and then you have this device here which is a, a phase ring in a sense because you have back wave energy coming around interfering here and coming back and, and recombining with the outer ring and what 
part of the design optimization that we went through in the model was to figure out one the optimal size. This is a 2.6 liter enclosure for a, a woofer application, and we were able to uh, you know improve that with the passive ring radiator here, but you could also add one to the back as, as uh, Simon was also saying, you know, where does that come from? The, the comparison is to a passive radiator mounted on the back side, And in this case, the other optimization was the length of this phase ring where, how, you know, when there's a back wave combining and coming around, how, what's the optimal length of that to have the, the combination to be, you know, constructive as opposed to deconstructive. The, so here's the model. I'll, I'll go through these quickly because that's and this is where we calibrated the model, and so we come to the you know the on-axis response of the Dienerberg one, and we can show you some of the things that go on inside uh, here quickly. I'll, I'll go into some you know side shows. Here's the phase ring again, and you can see it lower. This is 450, 600. We'll skip up up to the higher frequencies of 800. You start to see what's going on here. You see a phase uh, null going on, and at 1200 and 1600. And then as you get into the 4,600s, we start to see this type of behavior inside the box. And we can in some ways start to see the correlation to why we're getting more cohesive or coherent uh, combination of the, the off axis or the, the, the uh, mid band high frequencies because we're getting this back wave that is contributing to the passive radiator. So it's actually contributing to the higher frequencies as opposed to what it would traditionally do is just help the low end. Um, so if we go into a, uh, you know, this is the, the ring radiator design. You've got the, with the, pa with the passive on the back, this case, this is three inch on the front, the passive ring radiator on the back, as you can see, this is that comparison curve that we saw earlier here again, again, on axis. And we can take a look at the behavior side by side. We'll skip this one because it's hard to keep your eyeballs on it, but this is the same frequency points for the, the rear radiator, you can kind of see the outline of the ring radiator, the, the radiator back here with the active driver in the top. This is 450, 600, 800, 1200, and 1600. You can see that there's not much going on, whereas in the, the Dienerberg setup, um, there was something definitely going on. We were contributing to the forward, you know, to the radiation on the front. And here you see that we're seeing rear radiation at the best. And then as we go into the higher frequency, four, 600, and so on, you see that most of the radiation is, is deconstructive or just useless inside the box. And so we lose it. So it doesn't really contribute to the high frequencies. And then when we pull up that, that curve that we were looking at before, you can see again. And then hopefully that helps understand a little bit the differences in this, this particular plot that you were asking about, Simon. You know, a lot of it comes out the back and not to the front. And... Um, What's happening with the, the the passive ring radiator? It's helping to make a constructive combination of the rear radiation from the three three inch active driver with the passive ring radiator. And one of the things we did, which I don't have here to show, is and Mike mentioned it the the oralization portion of that. Um, once we had this design built for the the Dienerberg alignment. We did build up some prototypes, and those things were actually available to listen to. And there was, you know, the feedback on those listening experiences with the actual parts was that this is, you know, the mid range is so much clearer. I see, hear the voices better, uh, and I can, in the off axis response is very good. In a lot of cases, there seemed to be less low frequency harmonic distortion as well, so that we had cleared up some of the mid band issues that that can happen, or at least make it more cohesive and coherent. And we wanted to be able to compare that to an identical version of of the passive radiator radiating from the rear. We just didn't have the materials to do that. So what we did is took the output of the console model and put it into another tool we use from Familiar Sonics, which is available. And we've used this in vehicle uh, simulations before where we wanted to listen to a, a vehicle through headphones and to oralize with the head-related transfer function. I just took the results and put it into a room so we could listen to the two. Uh, I don't have that to demonstrate, but what we what he was talking about with the oralization is we could go back and forth between them, A, B, listen to it, and then move the speaker off axis from 0, 30 to 60. And those results were very impressive as well. And they actually mimicked what people were hearing in the the, the real time, in a real product of the the Dina Burn, when the, you, you walk off axis and you've got a very good, consistent um experience 
And so so we're, that, uh, basic understanding, you imagine a, a passive radiator or a port for that matter. You uh, plunk this uh, component into your speaker box and you get a, a, an extra peak at the low frequency, somewhere slightly yeah. below the driver's frequency. But what you're talking about mostly is uh, uh, its effects in the higher frequency range? Yeah, the, the difference that you saw on that the, the on-axis response, you see that peak that goes up, right? And that's what you would expect with the port or a passive radiator. But what's happening here is that we, and, and, I, and when I first started the modeling, I'd never listened to this part. I'd never experienced this part. I just did the modeling to see what would happen. And when you think about it in a very lumped parameter way, all you think that's going to happen is the port or the passive radiator experience, which you just talked about. And what we discovered is that there's something more going on uh, above that. And, and, and primarily it's in the mid range uh, frequencies that we're hearing it. And that contributes to a lower harmonic distortion. So as well as a fundamental improvement on the fundamental frequencies in the mid range as well. And so that's what we've discovered. And we took away the, the phase ring and looked at it and so to see what uh, its effects were, and it was pretty significant also, but uh, it, you still got the improved off axis, but you didn't have it optimized. So when you put the phase ring back into the model and start playing with its height, you then get this ability to fine tune and make that off axis response like it is here, uh, or decide what you want it to be, to be honest. You could change that by changing that design, but um, that's the essence of it. We saw a lot of mid-range uh, changes and you could see that with the phase relationship inside the box that we just showed earlier and that's that's exactly the benefits that we're seeing we're not only getting the effort the effect of a, a base response improvement with the, the port or the base you know passive radiator that you would traditionally find but you also get this uh, improvement in the mid-range and the off-axis response i want to say saying the, the same thing but looking at instead of the basic electric circuit analogy where you look at the speaker as an electrical filter at low frequencies now you're looking at everything more pneumatically or fluidically of how, how air is a gas is moving around what's laminar inside the enclosure even that sort of a dc way of looking at it and the effect of radiating of the speaker is better behaved as you go down a little bit lower in frequency it acts with a passive ring radiator acting axiosymmetric and equidistant it sort of controls the pattern a little bit lower so the off-axis response and the power response doesn't change as rapidly there's all these second and third order effects that are good using this stuff that won't show up in something like leap or something because it's not looking at at the right. air transmission both propagation and distance and phase and and pressure and variable stiffness at each radii because of the box and what's behind the box but all of it is improving it and so it's not just a a passive flat ring but there's a lot of other things in the way the speaker couples into the room in the front and the way it, it's better behave for less spurious anomalies in its butt yeah and that's kind of the first thing that occurred to us when we were modeling is that you know we thought well, well this is just a ported or a, a passive radiator model and that's a, a one-dimensional uh, lumped parameter model and it did on axis it behaved that way and then you start to see the effects of the mid-range in you know with the box enclosure and this is something that happens a lot you have to concern yourself where you're mounting this in a car or you're mounting it in a in a wall or a ceiling and you have to worry about those boundaries and what it turns out is you, you have to worry less because the off-axis response is better but and we didn't know that until we did the three-dimensional model in this take case taking some you know, advantage of some of the axisymmetrics portions of it and started to see that there is this effect in the mid-range that we didn't anticipate because you don't get that in a lumped parameter model. You have to actually see the um, the physics going on inside the box. Let me clarify things even to Roger. It's what he's saying is there's a difference between friends and friends with benefits. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, and in some of the measurements that were taken also, you can see, uh, and I think I may have some I could show you here in a second, uh, in terms of uh, things that other other things that we we care about, uh, the uh, the phase alignment, you know, and the the um, the THD. There, there are de definite benefits in the design. You, you get a very concentric uh, center of acoustic center here. And so you don't see a lot of the, you know, the things that happen when you have 
two radiating surfaces where the phase don't doesn't align and you get these uh, delay issues between the two uh, two radiating surfaces so it, it has those benefits for that very reason because it's it is concentric and it, in practical terms it is uh planar even though you do get an effect of the cone it acts a little bit like a horn as well and you can scale this that's one of the things that did happen we started out with a much larger model and d just shrunk it down to something that seemed to be most efficient for a six inch mounting arrangement that but it can take it down to uh you know the the earbud size or anywhere in between well wow. that's one of the beautiful things we did this year we cooperated with peter larson who builds the fine circle software and we were able to integrate the C2S technology into the fine circle. This just gives the ability for the engineers when they tinker with their next project to be able to go and see, you know what, will this option work for me based on whatever parameters I have? And they literally can see apple to apple if they want to have a port or if they want to have a passive radiator or if this technology may land and deliver them a better product as an end result. Okay, so after the uh, the technical, let's uh, like I think some people that might be considering to implement this in their products. So uh, if we're combining basically two, so if it was a system that had a passive radiator, obviously there could be some bill of material savings. Um, in a ported system, probably not so much. But uh, where 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 are we going to find some efficiencies on the commercial side? Like how, how are we going to, how are we going to, we've got, we've got something better. Okay. Now, now uh, where, where does it fit in, in the commercial side of things? Is there any, and also how far are we towards uh, going to mass production? We are working on a couple strategic units for in-house installation for hi-fi sound for movie theaters mm -hmm. and um, the similar version of the same driver will be used for commercial space because you don't need to overachieve 20,000 hertz just because there is no need for it. Pretty much we're hoping that in the next month or so we will have production ready, ready to go units, which we will be able to send to some potential customers to showcase what technology capable of doing. And at the same time, we're experimenting with multiple verticals at the same time. Uh, Roger is helping us to understand the best way to implement this technology in automotive. We're working with a few potential clients and trying to explain to them the benefits of this technology and something like a headphone driver, because Potentially, you cannot install the port or passive radiator in your headphone design, but you're still generating um, the back wave energy. It's it's there one way or another. This just gives you a better way to to capture that and and use it as a benefit versus trying to fight with it and get rid of it. And we can we 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 explore in few strategic partnerships and entertaining questions from potential licensees. Let's put it this way. Okay, so the, the basic strategy is to go where it's impossible to put a passive somewhere else on the quote-unquote box or a port. And if you focus on that where there is no competition, it sounds like it's a good pathway for a business. Um, okay. Um, so anything else that we need to add to or questions from Simon Weston? Let's see how we go. Nothing for now. <laughs> for now. Uh, Roger, uh, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, other than um, the the potential for it is, is just like you said, and it, it is very scalable, as, as, as Simon was also pointing out. So one of the, the benefits, say, for exclusively for automotive, but also for the, auto, the home install is the fact that it can be packaged in a way, and especially if you take this six inch, you know, and it's only a, a 2.6 liter box that fits right into the the wall mounting that you would typically run into and it also fits into a car mounting so um one of the things we we'd like to do is demonstrate that put that together and you know there are two different things that you're talking about there one has an environmental impact for the car so you have to look at whether it's going to survive that so one of the next steps is to make sure that the building material is not only um what you expect it to be but it's also 
automotive grade and you know anticipate those issues and nothing in this is exotic it's it's not exotic materials it's a, a new approach and a new idea so that is straightforward i think all the materials are genuinely transferable to automotive grade and no problem and mm -hmm. uh, you know, the weight is also going to be less because you're not using the same size driver to get the same effects so. okay yeah. all right mike any uh any random comments you'd like to throw in as you're always good at? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, one of the benefits, if you take the case that Roger describes, you go with a smaller speaker, then the um, power response will be better. And like in ceiling speakers, you can space them further apart. On the other hand, one of the benefits is the mechanical depth of the speaker will be shallower, as Roger was mentioning, uh, when you go to a smaller speaker, it's less deep. And and then a lot of the alignments that work with this end up needing less back volume. And then you have the potential of using a meta material like this end base stuff that Apple uses that lets you half the back volume. So you could sort of shrink wrap the speaker uh, with Dynaberg, but it also acoustically means you don't have to EQ to get that bass back in. So you have very shallow installs with very and less speakers in the room because they have wider and smoother off-axis response. So all these things add up, uh, but also this all applies to personal audio in a car where you use headrest audio. And mm -hmm. now you have, you know, good low end to the passive ring radiator. You have a very shallow product that fits into uh, both, you know, electroacoustically, but also physically into a headrest and stuff. So there's there's a lot of places where this really is a silver bullet for a half a dozen reasons um, that have great potential. Yeah, okay. the, the point that Mike just made about headrest is, you know, say I put this in the door, maybe I don't need an enclosure in the door, someone says, but in a headrest, I'm going to need an enclosure. In some of these uh, applications, you definitely need to have an enclosure because you can't live in the space that it's existing in. Some buffers are one of them usually. So, you know, if there has to be an enclosure, this is a better approach to it for that reason. And if you can put a, you know, a form factor that fits into the door as an enclosure that's very shallow already, which we do today uh, in many applications, then we're better off with the, this approach as well. So, yeah. And with headrest audio, the if you're using, say, a six, a five inch frame with a three inch speaker, uh, then the frame can be without punched windows. And now you have a modular approach that's cost-effective and very shallow that the car manufacturers like to see modules. All right. Okay, Simon Donenberg, any last words before we say goodbye? I think the big idea, the big idea I want to leave you guys with is that this design is have a lot of potential and time will show how far they will go. It's just about how much imagination we have. That's pretty much it. But there is a lot of areas where this technology can go in and help to improve the future products. Let's put it this way. All right. Okay. Well, I thank all these guys for joining us today. So everybody like, subscribe, share, uh, wherever you're watching this or listening to this. And, uh, We'll see you all in the next episode. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.